the town of Carmel. Uh, board members' names are in front of you on the podium. Uh, town Code Enforcement Officer Mike Carnazza and Town Attorney Greg Volschetti are with us as well. Um, the way we operate is we'll hear the case. I'll ask you to come up. I'll swear you in unless you're, you're an attorney. Um, I'll ask that you speak clearly and precisely into the microphone because this is being recorded for, for minutes, so it's got to be as accurate as possible. Um, if you are going to present and you need to look at a board, grab the loose mic on this um, stem right here. And uh, um, if, if you're going to speak from the public, be sure to sign it. There's a sign-in sheet right on the on the podium as well. All right, so we'll hear the case. Um, I'll ask for input from the board. Then I'll ask for input from the public on any application. Once we close an application, there's no further input from anybody, so please respect that and keep comments to yourself. Will you all please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> all right, our first holdover application tonight is for Homeland Towers LLC, partnership with Verizon Wireless for variation of 156.62, 156-42, and 156.20, as well as an interpretation seeking permission to install a wireless telecommunications facility. The property is located at 254 Croton Falls Road, Mohopac, New York, 10541. And it's tax map 6519-1-43. Yep. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Robert Cordioso with the law firm of Snyder and Snyder on behalf of the applicants. Okay. Anybody else going to be speaking tonight? Most likely not, but okay. my client is here this evening. Okay. So since we last met back at the end of August, we did submit the materials we spoke about uh, at the last meeting for this particular application. Uh, they included some of the prior materials. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you just turn the mic up to you? <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. Is it on? Is that better? Yeah, thank you. I don't know if it's on or not. Thank you. Yeah, Hopefully that's better. It sounds like it is. It's on. It, the light's on at least. Okay. So we did submit some materials we spoke about last time, including uh, the backup documentation from our radio frequency engineer, which the town's own radio frequency engineer had uh, agreed and concluded that the proposed height was necessary to provide the necessary coverage. We submitted an appraisal report, uh, and we also submitted various documentation uh, that we did copy to the planning board. The documents that we had copied to the planning board included a revised EAF uh, with a visual addendum, a letter from the DEC confirming that there were no wetland permits required. We submitted uh, correspondence with the DEP showing that we had access to the property. We submitted uh, a letter from Mr. Ray Vergati confirming that the alternative sites that were proposed were not feasible. We submitted uh, a supplemental response again from PeerCon our radio frequency engineer explaining some of the data that we had previously submitted. We submitted a letter from our engineer showing there would be no adverse effects related to fire safety. We showed that there, the facility as located on the property meets all applicable setbacks. And we confirmed that there are no adverse effects on historic resources from our engineer uh, firm EBI Consulting. Uh, finally, we added uh, to the site application the revised plans based on some comments from the ECB. And we added also some additional viewpoints and visual renderings from Saratoga Associates from the closest properties showing no adverse visual impact. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be answer happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Um, I mean, really, this is a continuation from last time, so I'll, I'll open it up to the board members. Are any questions or comments? John? Uh, I, have, I have no uh, questions. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. No further questions. No further questions. All right. Does anybody in the public have any input, questions, or comments? Sir? May I take the podium? Yes. Absolutely. 
State your name and address for the record. And you are an attorney? I am an attorney. My name is Andrew Campanelli. Campanelli Associates, PC 1757 Merrick Avenue, Suite 204. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> I understand this first application is concerning the tower proposed for 254 Croton Falls Road, correct? Okay. Yep. Um, I represent um, six homeowners uh, opposed to the current application for a variance. I previously submitted a memorandum in opposition and supporting exhibits. I believe I've submitted sufficient copies for one member of each of the board. I just want to make some uh, initial comments first. Uh, if the board chooses to close the public hearing this evening, I respectfully request that you leave the record open for a limited period of time. The reason for this is since my first review of the application, it's my understanding the applicant has made certain changes. I want to and submitted additional documents, which I heard described by Mr. Gordiosa this evening. I'd simply like an opportunity to review them and submit any responses in writing. It wouldn't take long. As soon as I see them, I could probably prepare them in two weeks. So if I can get a two-week period after the close of the public hearing to submit written comments, I would very much appreciate that. With regard to um, the memorandum that's previously be, been submitted, I believe I've established before the board, based upon substantial evidence, that the proposed installation would have an adverse aesthetic impact on the nearby properties. Uh, as outlined in the memorandum, I won't go through everything in detail. Um, we submitted letters from the residents, which the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit has identified as substantial evidence of adverse aesthetic impacts. Um, it is critical, for, in my view, not merely to seek to convince the board to deny the application, uh, but to make sure it gets denied in a way that conforms to the requirements of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. It is critical to me, therefore, that the board make certain factual determinations, one of which is that the proposed tower would, in fact, have a substantial adverse aesthetic impact. And you, if you make such a decision and a determination that it does, that you cite the evidence in the record. Uh, that will, number one, satisfy the constraints of the Telecommunications Act and would likely reduce any possibility of anyone challenging decision and, of course, reduce the likelihood they would prevail if they saw fit to file such an application. In similar vein, I submitted what's known as substantial evidence of reduction in property values. Uh, in similar vein, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit has ruled that um, when a tower is irresponsibly placed too close to residential properties, it, will ha it can have an adverse impact on property values. And the federal court has said you don't need appraisers. Uh, you can get letters from licensed real estate brokers, and they are, in fact, very good substantial evidence. Uh, we didn't just choose any real estate brokers. We, choose we chose real estate brokers who are licensed here for lengthy periods of time. That clothes them with the authority not only as a licensed professional, but shows they have an acute understanding of this specific real estate market. Um, so I submit to you the letters from the brokers constitute substantial evidence that the proposed installation will have a significant adverse impact on the property values in nearby homes. Um, who, who was the broker again? Um, there were a number of brokers. It's attached as exhibit. One moment. They're attached to the briefs, but I've sent them in a while ago, so I forgot. I'll have to pull that for you. Um, they're each they're attached to both of the briefs. Okay, no, don't worry. I'll about submit it. before it's the evening. Um, with regard to the allegations that they established a need for this facility, I respectfully request the board look hard at the evidence and make a determination that the applicant has not established that they suffer from a significant gap in personal wireless services. Contrary to what they're alleging, they haven't given you any hard data. Now, I handle these cases not merely across the entire state of New York, but across the entire United States. I handle them everywhere. And when there are significant, there's two types of deficiencies which render a new facility necessary. One would be a significant gap in service. The Telecommunications Act doesn't guarantee seamless coverage for every carrier. What it protects them in favor of the carriers is that if they suffer from what's called a significant gap in personal wireless services, and they establish that before this board, and they also establish that the proposed facility is the least intrusive means of remedying that gap, then you must grant their application. Um, they haven't established, certainly, that the height they're proposing is the minimum height necessary, and that height may change, and we'll talk about that in a second. But normally, when they really have a gap in service, they do an actual drive test, and they give you the hard data. From what I saw in the application, there is no hard data. They did computer modeling. <laughs> And in every single case I've seen, when they don't give you the hard data, there is no significant gap in service. In similar vein, where they're claiming capacity is the problem, 
They're not claiming there's a gap in area of service. They're claiming that at peak times, the system can't handle all the calls. Once again, if such a gap, if such a deficiency exists, they will give you hard data. By way of example, in the town of Phillipstown, Homeland went in with Mr. Gordioso, claimed they had a gap, they claimed they had a capacity, capacity deficiency, and they provided actual drop call data from Verizon. That is proof positive of a capacity, of a capacity deficiency. You don't have that here. Consistent with the lack of evidence, I attached for both towers actual printouts from the database maintained by Verizon. Verizon maintains its own database and has an interactive website. Its database has an accumulation of every data spot, every geographic point, and if you log into their system, you can type an address and they give you two critical pieces of information. Number one, they indicate whether or not they have a significant gap in their personal wireless service. Attached to both of the briefs, I printed out, which was current as of a few months ago, each of the proposed sites for the locations. According to Verizon's own database, Verizon has no significant gaps in coverage at either of these locations. It doesn't mean they have perfect coverage. They're not guaranteed perfect coverage. But you as a board are not obligated by the Federal Telecommunications Act to grant their application unless they establish there's a significant gap. And according to Verizon, there is no significant gap. Simultaneously, Verizon's database also indicates the level of service. That affects capacity. They're, by Verizon's own standards, they define their capacity services as no service, fair, good, or excellent, excellent being best capacity. For both of these sites, as reflected in the exhibits that I provided to the board, at each site, Verizon itself specifies its capacity level at both sites is excellent. It's the best service level they have at anywhere in the United States. And again, I handle these cases all over the country. I know what they show. Now, Mr. Mr. Gordioso may get up and say, well, that's a marketing tool. And they even say, there's a disclaimer that says we don't have perfect coverage. I'm not saying Verizon's claiming they have perfect seamless coverage. What I'm telling you is, according to Verizon's own database, not third-party information, according to Verizon, they have no significant gap in coverage and no significant capacity deficiency, which means if they don't comply with your code, this, court is, this, this board is well within its power to deny the application. I also take issue with the fact that Mr. Gordioso cite an engineering report from Ron Grafe, and it, it strains the imagination that he does this because he knows what the problem is. Ron Grafe. Hey, can, we, can we please leave the commentary about Mr. Gordioso uh, and, and focus on the actual application? I, I just don't think Let's keep it not personal. Let's oh, it's not personal at okay. all. Ronald Grafe is the closely held shareholder of a corporation <laughs> that owns a cell tower. One of his principal tenants on the cell tower is Verizon. Verizon has been paying him thousands and thousands of dollars a year for a decade. And Mr. Grafe has been fired by at least one municipality I know of because when he, retained, he was retained by the municipality, he didn't disclose to them his conflict of interest. Can anybody on this board truthfully expect Mr. Grafe to come before the board and tell this board that Verizon is coming to you and says they have a gap in service? And he's going to claim, he's going to tell you that they don't have a gap in service where they're paying him thousands of dollars a month every month for 10 years. The fact that he did not disclose to this board that he has such a conflict of interest destroys his credibility, and this board should completely ignore his report. It is completely defective, just as defective as the visual impact analysis which have been provided by Homeland in this case. With the visual impact analysis, once again, as Homeland is well aware, according to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, when you provide a visual impact analysis to a board, the whole purpose is to give the board an accurate depiction of what the adverse aesthetic impact can be. Not surprisingly, in every case, Homeland omits from its visual impact depictions any images taken from the actual homeowner's sites that are going to suffer the worst adverse aesthetic impacts. Federal courts have said again and again, when they do this, boards should, should ignore them because they're defective. Now, with regard to the variance, the variances they're looking for are fairly substantial. In the uh, Croton Falls Road, application. At this juncture, they're claiming they want a tower for 140 feet. Um, at 140 feet, that's, um, if I understand correctly, they're trying to exceed the maximum under your code, which I think, if I'm reading it correctly, the maximum permissible is 75 feet. If they go to 140, that means they want to exceed your code by 87 percent. I respectfully submit they haven't shown what they need to show. Number one, that they need this tower in the first place, much less that they need to have it built at this height. Even worse, if you approve this tower at 140 feet, that doesn't mean the tower is only going to be 140 feet. 
Under the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, once the facility is built, Homeland Towers will have the ability to thereafter increase the height by an additional 20 feet, and this board will be powerless to stop them. That means that the tower would go up to basically 160, which is more than 200%. I think it's 213% of the height actually permitted under your code. Um, I respectfully submit under the circumstances that should not be permitted. I would also ask the board to consider two things. If you want to know the height of what this tower is going to be, uh, there's two things you can do. Number one, look at the base of the tower, both in this case and for the Dixon Road Tower. When they submitted plans, I assume you've got drawings for the, for the tower. Okay? Um, the base of a tower for a 140 or 160 foot tower is significantly different than the base of a 110 foot tower. If they showed you new plans, and the new plans show the same base, nobody, nobody builds a 110 foot tower and, and employs a base designed for a 140 or 160. It never happens. What that tells you is, eventually this tower is gonna to be 160. That's what it tells you. And the only way you can stop it is if you get the property owner, not Homeland, you'd have to get the property owner to agree to impose a covenant, a restrictive covenant running with the land that no tower will ever be built beyond the 140. If you make it a condition of your zoning decision, let's say you grant the variance and you put in a condition it can never go to 160, they won't honor it. They'll just build it to 160 and force you to sue them. And what they'll claim is you can't do that because your power is preempted by federal law. And I've seen it before. So that's not going to happen. Um, I'm going to let the record stand with my brief. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. My only other request is please, if you choose to close the public hearing this evening, I ask that you keep the record open to afford me an opportunity to see any changes in the application so I can respond appropriately. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council. Uh, I open to the, to the public first. Okay. Let me, anybody else from the public wish to speak on this application? Ma'am? Um, hi, my name is Gail Fierro. I'm 308 Croton Falls Road. Um, yeah, I'm swear you in. Oh, yeah. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Um, first, we know that the deals have already had the uh, variance for the, their 200, 2015 retirement home, and they're going for the great other variance. The other one, the other. Uh, the Homeland Towers recently sent revision application of letters to the PBA board because they, uh, they had a lot of um, misconceptions and things they had to correct. I read over all of their, uh, their new ones and um, I wrote a letter myself to EBI and Saratoga because they're still incorrect blatantly incorrect with the visual that they're giving specifically of our, we have two um, historical <coughs> buildings on 294 Croton Falls Road and the well house. And one, next time I'll, I'll blow this one up, but they put here that uh, from the Google Street image of the driveway for 292 to 300 Croton Falls Road, that the view shed mapping predicts visibility from this driveway. However, as demonstrated by this photo, the modeling is conservative and the views, if any exist, will be obscured by the arching tree branches and the nearly 1,400 feet of intervening distance they're talking about from the cell tower to our two historical buildings. They are not 1,400 feet, they're approximately six to 800 feet. And um, what they did was they took a picture from the end of the driveway. So from the end of the driveway to the tower would be 1,400 feet, but not any of our homes or our historic buildings. So there, it's, it's still wrong what they're putting putting to, and they've, they've given everybody copies of this. So like I said, I have it on record that I sent EBI and um, Saratoga. And I think I gave every letter to the town board, the, all the boards. Um, okay. So we, first of all, we need all the view shed mappings 
corrected. They need, I, I gave them the uh, okay to get in touch with me, come to my house, which is 497 feet, take a picture from my backyard exactly to where the tower is. They need to take a picture standing in front of the well house and put the camera up toward the tower, not the other way. Their, their pictures are blatantly incorrect and misleading, especially I couldn't get over this 1,400 foot thing. The other thing is one of the letters uh, they, they wrote to, because I had, a, a, I had a, a, what do you call it, a problem with the fact that they wrote a letter to um, Putnam Valley Historical Society to to uh, invitation to comment. Putnam County in Mayapack knows all about our historical uh, buildings, but they never wrote Putnam County, Mayapack, any of the historical people here. And they always, for the past 35 years, the Carmel. Mayapack Historian's Office have called us wanting more information about our property. So they write this letter to the Putnam Valley, I guess thinking maybe you just see the word va Putnam and you wouldn't look into it deeper. But like, I'm in this to the end. I'm not giving up. They're still wrong. Everything is so wrong. These you know, at the, I know the planning board has more thing, more things that I can say about it. But like, they give out, they give out these kinds of things, like that we're never going to see this, never going to see it from where our places are. It's, it's blatantly untrue. Okay. Blatantly untrue. Um, I think I'm almost done. Good. Oh, and the other thing I. I was um, in contact with Tom Maxson, who's chairman of the Highlands Historical Preservation. He told me he's been watching our case. And <clears throat> Mr. Gordioso, and it's not nothing personal, but he had publicly stated that our case was nothing like the Agor Hill Street case, which got knocked down. Well, Mr. Um, Maxson told me in an email that ours is the same type of case that and they have gotten they got um, knocked down because of the historical nature of the agor place Highland, they're all trying to just like push this under the rug mr deal knew about it he knew all about and nobody put it on the nobody said to homeland oh yeah there is a uh, historical buildings that should be looked into so now it's got so they're it's like I say, their things are still incorrect. Um, that's it. That's okay. it. And I, I have millions of pictures, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Can you just sign before you leave the podium? Anyone else wish to be heard on this application? State your name and address for the record, please. Yes, uh, my name is Bryce Fierro, 308, uh, 292 Croton Falls Road. I live next to uh, my mother here. Raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so we'll help you God. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you all for your service. Um, the reason I come here tonight is just because um, I'm a little bit upset that um, you're even considering giving this variance um, on this particular property. The property was given a previous variance um, because they didn't have the proper frontage. Um, and looking at our own co town code, section 156-62, allows allowing a special exception use permit for a wireless tower communications at 254 will increase the already existing nonconformity of this parcel. A variance was already granted by this board for the construction of a single family residence on this parcel on 82715. This is a landlocked parcel with multiple easements for access. The variance granted was to alleviate the 100 foot frontage on a town, country, or state road code requirement. Additionally, the variance was granted based upon the statement that no future subdivision was planned. Granting a special exception use permit for this address will be a violation of the section. <clears throat> um, I watch a lot of the meetings on TV, and I, and I see, you know, how we're trying to keep the New England feel in this town. 
and I don't see how having a, a tower next to a, a nine acre piece of property that has historical things on it. I mean, you know, the lawyer said, you know, Mr. Gordioso said that there, this isn't next to historical property. It is, you know, it's within 600 feet of a place that a book, a Revolutionary Road movie was made about it. I don't want to go off on a tangent about it, but it is historical. And to have, you know, you're never going to see Mr. Gordioso or Homeland Towers down at the deli. You're not going to see him at Ace Hardware. You're not going to see any, any, you're going to see these other people here that live in this town. These big companies come into our town and they give, I won't say lies, but they're accurate, inaccurate information telling us that our housing value is going to go up when a tower goes up. You know, I don't think it's very common that uh, someone's house value is going to go up when a tower goes up next to it. And, um, you know, I just feel that it's a small town. I grew up here. You know, I served honorably in the United States Marine Corps. And there's a lot of veterans around here. And I work at the VA. And I see, you know, people want to come up here to relax. People work in the city. They don't want to come home to a cell tower. You know what I mean? If we wanted that, we'd live in New York City where they have cell towers on top of every building. And, you know, it definitely doesn't belong next to, a, a, you know, something where there's a history in this town. And, you know, and the other thing I wanted to say is I'm not sure if this board is aware of the fact that um, our lawyer here has brought up the fact that these towers do catch fire. Um, and I don't know how they would get a, a fire truck up there with, you know, a road that's already 12, it's only 12 feet. It's not even... Allow, I think uh, whatever town code is for a fire truck, it's not going to allow it. The road's washing out. They're not paving it. Our land is right up against it, so they're going to have to address drainage issues, which they haven't even done with us. They're just trying to push this through inaccurate evidence. So I, I just would hope that you know this town would do their due diligence and please accept this and not not accept this because you know I, I don't want to have to take this further, but I really feel like you know I'm, I'm in it for the long haul, like my mother. And if I have to litigate, I will litigate because I'm not going to let something happen that's not legal. And I just please ask you to consider what we're all saying here because a lot of these people here, we don't want this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you sir. I'll take that into, into consideration. And thank you for your service. You. Anybody else wish to be heard from the public on this application? All right, Mr. Gordio, I'll forward you. Opportunity to respond. Yes, that's a separate application. I'll just work backwards, just because that's how I have my notes. Um, regarding the drainage issues, we've dealt with all the drainage issues. There's a full erosion control and sediment plan that's been reviewed by the town engineer, and the plan has been revised <coughs> multiple times uh, to the town engineer's satisfaction. It's also an issue before the planning board, but th we've totally addressed any potential drainage issues. Regarding uh, fire access, we've submitted a report from our engineer showing that there's uh, absolute fire access to the property. We've detailed all of the required specifications. We've shown on the plans, actually, the turning radii and so forth and so on to be able to get a truck up there. Granting a special use permit is in no way absolutely a violation of either any prior approvals of this property or the town code, simply put. Totally unrelated, I'm at Fraser's Hardware Store probably every week. The, the EBI and Saratoga reports are completely accurate. The original application includes a determination from the New York State Historic Preservation Office that there were no uh, uh, historic properties or properties eligible for listing on the historic register in the area. After that uh, information was provided, Ms. Fierro did make an attempt and was successful at having uh, two uh, buildings on her property uh, made eligible for listing on the historic register. Since that time, in the last filing, you have it in your package from EBI. We did not only uh, a letter from a, um, uh, a specific person from EBI that has the qualifications under the Section 106 process, uh, that is a Department of Interior historian. We have that in the record. We also, from Saratoga Associate, had viewshed mapping showing the tower would not be visible, as well as actual sight lines of the tower and the proposed and the surrounding property. So that's all in the package, and that's all correct by both EBI and Saratoga Associates. Regarding the visuals, the visuals were also done in conjunction with the planning board. We went through a laborious process and methodology 
We actually held six different uh, balloon tests at this property at 180 feet. The proposed tower, just by way of recollection, is 140 feet. It's proposed to be a stealth tree design. We also did a crane test at 180 feet. We took photographs at predetermined locations. Uh, from our consultant based on the view shed mapping. We had the town planner review that. They added specific locations. We made an announcement at prior planning board meetings. If anyone wanted any additional viewpoints, we'd be happy to take them. No one took us up on that offer at that time. We did the full report from Saratoga Associates. It was reviewed at the planning board level by the town planner and the other consultants, and there were no comments with respect to any inaccuracies in that report. With respect to Mr. Grafe, he did review the application. He's a New York State licensed professional engineer. He was hired specifically by the planning board, and he did conclude that the proposed height is necessary to provide the required coverage. Regarding the comments that there's no hard data in the application, that's simply not true. Not only did we provide the propagation maps, we did provide the drive test data. It was stated the drive test data was not provided. That is not correct. We provided the drive test data. We provided the drive test data because we conducted the drive test at multiple heights when we did the crane that I mentioned before as part of the visual methodology. So not only was the methodology uh, that was included with the original application, the propagation maps that you have, we also did actual drive test data of both the existing signal in the area and multiple different heights to be able to come up with the minimum height of 140 feet. That was all reviewed. The, yes. I'm reading the drive data. I have a question about that. Sure. As I read it, it says 4G LTE. You didn't look at anything downgraded from that. Again, this is all about making cell calls and not necessarily data. Where's your 3G data? I don't see that in any of the megahertz at all. No, that is in there. Actually, that's not correct. So we actually provided 850 megahertz. We provided that's 2100 not. megahertz. It's in, it's in the reports. We provided 2100 megahertz. 1900? We, I don't see that here. Uh, they're not operating at 1900. They're, they're operating. Verizon does operate. On this one, though, we provided both the 2100 the 700 and the 850. The 850, the 3G, is being sunsetted by the end of the year, so it's not relevant in the first place. But nevertheless, we showed the gap at the most conservative level, which is the 700, and at the most beneficial to us at the 2100 because of the frequency range. We showed all three different frequency ranges, 850, 700, and 2100, in the drive test data and also in the KPI data as well. So if you look at the KPI data, that was specifically requested by the planning board, which includes the drop calls and the access failure rates. Mr. Grafe, after reviewing, said it wasn't even necessary because, as we've stated, this is not a capacity site. This is a coverage site. So all of that data is in the reports from PeerCon, and it was reviewed by Mr. Grafe. So we did provide all of that data in the various PeerCon reports. The facility meets all of the setbacks. As far as the real estate broker's uh, assessment, we did submit that report. It includes approximately 15 different surveys over a five-year period. Um, despite what was said, the federal courts have not upheld unsubstantiated broker letters that have no data. The report we submitted was an actual MAI appraiser certified letter, which has been upheld by multiple courts. I cited to that in the letter to the planning board, which was included in your package. Finally, uh, with respect to uh, the comment of additional time because the application has changed, the application has not changed. This facility has been exactly the same since it's been filed here. The materials that we submitted were the supplemental materials that were previously submitted. They've been on record since the end of September. Uh, with that also, the shot clock is set to expire at the end of the month. So we'd respectfully request that the application hearing be closed this evening and the decision made. Thank you. Okay. Board members? I have, uh, I have one question. Um, in the original plans, um, there was no submission for uh, filing an uh, alteration application, an FAA 7460, and there was an opinion letter that you did submit. Correct. But I'm just curious why uh, we didn't file that application so that airspace analysis could be done for the construction of that. Uh, facility because it was not required so because of the height of the tower and the location of the tower it did not have to be required to be filed with the FAA okay. I have no further questions okay, Phil. council any any comment on um, the adverse aesthetics argument that was made So the visual renderings, I think, speak for themselves. We've lowered the height of the facility 
uh, multiple times down to 140 feet, which has been determined to be the minimum height. We've also added the stealth design, which is the tree design. The facility meets all of the requirements uh, with respect to the setbacks, and we did the visual renderings that show any of the views would be very distant uh, from this proposed facility. <laughs> the um, Saratoga Associates Report uh, specifically comments on the DEC manual for assessing visual impacts. And the DEC manual specifically says that visibility alone, even, even um, stock visibility, is not a reason to find a significant adverse visual impact uh, with respect to these types of facilities. So even in the areas where the facility is visible, it's visible from quite a distance. We've added the visual mitigation of the stealth tree design, and we've minimized the height, and we've located on a property that's a large property and distant from adjoining uses. So we don't believe that there's an adverse, a significant, particularly adverse visual impact as determined by Saratoga Associates. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. No questions. No questions. All right. Uh, just for the public's understanding, us as a board, we have to, for an area variant situation, we have to take all of the following into consideration. Number one, will an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby properties be created by granting of the variance? Different standards. Okay, so to so watch that, okay. Um, I guess at this point, I'll look to close the public hearing. Motion to close. Second. I had opened it to the public, and you I would had. I'd just like to address um, the things that he's saying that are inaccurate. He says, oh, no, I don't hear him being sworn in, I know he's a lawyer, but what we're all trying to say is. All right, I'll, then I'll afford you the opportunity to respond. And just, if I may, to answer your question, it was the March 26, 2019 PeerCon report, and it was right. Exhibit D, which is the 850 CDMA drive test. Thank you. Bryce Fierro. Um, what I just wanted to just say is what's inaccurate is um, in layman's terms, what they have to do is when they want to put a cell tower in, they have to go and, and um, send a letter out to the local historical society asking if there's any impact on historical properties in the area. Our property was 200 years old. It used to be the old Mayapak Playhouse. And there's an article in the paper about it last year. Um, so. Putnam County is very aware of it. That's why they sent the letter to Putnam Valley. They didn't send a letter of notice to our local town. So therefore, we didn't know about this application. We weren't given the right. We weren't notified properly because our Putnam County Historical Society wasn't notified. They sent the letter to Putnam Valley. So legally, they didn't send it to, the, to a local place. They, they kind of did it uh, sneakily and sent it to somewhere that's just out of our town, far enough that nobody picked up on it. And then they were also supposed to send a letter to local Indian tribes, and they picked some tribes that were far out of the area. And we have all the evidence, and, and I'm just saying, you know, I don't, I don't know why, um, you know, I, I don't like it when it's not honest, you know, and to sit here and say that it doesn't affect our property values is, is really crazy. Thank you for letting me speak again. Okay. Thank you. There's no requirement of the town process to send it to the historic society. Actually, it was notified in the local newspaper. It was sent to all the proper parties. It was noticed to the town. It's been in front of the town now for multiple public hearings, both at the planning board and this board. With respect to the Indian tribes, we did send it to the correct Indian tribes. It's through an FCC database. Sometimes the tribes are tribes that you would not expect. So sometimes you see tribes from Oklahoma that actually have um, some type of claim even in the Northeast, and we send the notice to all the applicable tribes pursuant to the FCC and the Section 106 process. Okay. All right, at this point, I'll look for a motion. Motion to close. Do I have a second? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Application number two. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm recusing myself in this one. Okay. This is for Homeland Towers LLC. 
for a variation of 15662, 156-42, 156-20, as well as an interpretation seeking permission to install a wireless telecommunications facility. Property is located at 36 Dixon Road, Carmel, New York, and is known by tax map 54-1-6. And the record should reflect that Rose Fabiano has recused herself from this one as well. Yes, as noted. And Silvio. And Silvio just did. Was there a reason for the recusal just for my notes? Do we know? Uh, none was given, but I'm sure he has his reasons, or she has his, her reasons as well. And it is a seven member board, correct? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, for the record, Robert Gordioso with the law firm of Snyder and Snyder on behalf of the applicants. Uh, very similar to the other application, we did copy the board on the materials that were previously submitted to the planning board that we previously discussed, including the lane appraisal report, the prior PeerCon uh, engineering reports that were, uh, again, approved by Mr. Grafe as being the minimum height to provide the necessary coverage. We included the site plan changes uh, and a letter from our engineering firm detailing that. In addition to the planning board, we submitted uh, a number of additional materials that we did copy to this board as well, including the SHPO concurrence that there would be no adverse uh, impact on historic properties because there were none within the potential area of impact. We confirmed with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Conservation of New York State. Uh, we also included a letter from EBI confirming no adverse impact on eagles. We submitted a letter from Mr. Uh, Wimmer uh, from Homeland Towers uh, confirming that none of the alternative sites that were proposed were feasible, including McDonough Park, which the town was unwilling to lease to Homeland Towers. Uh, we also included as part of this application a, a second alternative uh, location on the property. While I think that's uh, more relevant to the special permit and the planning board application, we did include that. Um, basically, the alternative location is uh, further from the residences on this area, on the complete opposite side of the property, and closer to the park. So we did uh, propose two alternative locations on this particular property. Uh, finally, we included, uh, as well as that, uh, a DEC mapped uh, plan showing there were no DEC wetland impacts and visual renderings from the park and, sur and the surrounding area of the second alternative site on the property. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Okay. Board members. Uh, I have no further questions. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. No questions. All right. I'll open it up to the public for any <coughs> input on this application. For the record, Andrew J. Campanelli, Campanelli, Campanelli and Associates, PC, 1757 Merrick Avenue, Suite 204, Merrick, New York. Once again, members of the board, respectfully, I just turn up the mic. Yeah. Once again, respectfully, I submitted a brief. I believe I've submitted sufficient copies for each member of the board, along with exhibits under separate cover. By the way, for reference, the um, <clears throat> the real estate broker's letters, which I submitted as evidence of reduction in property values. <clears throat> for this uh, for this exhibit uh, for this application, they are attached as Exhibit C to the exhibit submitted in opposition to this application. And just for reference and purposes on the previous application for Corton Falls Road, the broker's letters were attached as Exhibit M. So they're all before the board in the record. Um, I'm constrained to address the um, <clears throat> peer con reports that have been submitted by Homeland. I respectfully request that the board examine very carefully what peer con alleges to have received Verizon. Uh, as the data based upon which it rendered its conclusions. The PeerCon reports, and I've seen many, many of them, they appear to me, quite frankly, to be canned reports. They look remarkably consider when I go, remarkably identical when I go from Phillipstown to Thompson to wherever, Carmel, Hickory, doesn't matter. Usually on page five of the report, it glosses over the type of data they got from Verizon and the source. And they will say, we got engineering data from Verizon. That's not sufficient. Okay. If they want to show capacity deficiency, they should say, we got dropped call records. Okay. Verizon and every carrier has the ability with their computer system, if they have a capacity deficiency, all they need to do is punch in a few keystrokes and the computer will spit out an actual list of every single drop call at any geographic location at any given time. In similar vein, their drive test analysis is similarly defective. They have not given you the hard data. Don't let them gloss over it. What they gave you was computer modeling. 
If they did a drive test, that means they took a device and attached it to a cell phone or a device, and they drove through an area where they did testing. That device will record the actual signal strengths every few milliseconds. So on a two-hour drive, you'll get several hundred thousand records. They didn't give you the records. What they did is they took their interpretation of the records and they introduced variables. What does that mean? Introducing variables means they use a program where they multiply the actual signal strengths by various factors to, in their mind, account for reductions in signal strength when the signal goes through the trees or for in-building coverage. They'll say, okay, well, exterior coverage is this, but we have to figure out what in-building coverage is, so we have to reduce the actual signal strength by a factor to account for the reduction in signal strength loss will suffer when the signal passes into a building. So the figures you got in those propagation maps are not the actual figures. They are manipulated numbers. That's why when I say hard data, you should ask for the actual signal strength records. And if it's capacity deficiency, ask for actual dropped call records. Those are much harder to manipulate. And Verizon is not going to give you false dropped call records. I don't want to hear about a marketing report. It's not going to happen. So once again, they have failed to meet their burden under your code to establish a need to greatly exceed the maximum height limitation set forth in the requirements of your code, which quite frankly are smart planning requirements. Let's face it, cell towers are a necessary evil. Everybody loves their phones, you have to have cell towers. But your code, like most jurisdictions across the country, has smart planning provisions. What does that mean? Smart jurisdictions enact regulations which enable them to have cell towers strategically placed to accomplish several specific objectives. First, you want to saturate the area with coverage. Number two, you want to minimize the number of structures necessary to provide that coverage and have them no taller than necessary. And at the same time, try to keep them away from residents so you minimize the adverse impacts on residential properties. This is a blatant example of an utter disregard for your code. There is no reason anybody <clears throat> would put a tower 50 feet from a residence a tower of this height. If one of your residents came and wanted to put a 110-foot foot, foot, 110 foot tower for whatever reason, 50 feet from the neighbor's property line, you look at them like they have three heads. This should be treated no different than any other zoning application. This shows complete disregard for adverse aesthetic impacts, and there's no effort, none at all, to try to minimize the adverse aesthetic impacts. But a most critical import is they haven't established a need with hard data. And once again, as far as their aesthetic impact images, they're a joke. Um, also, to the extent that they submit an appraisal, a lane appraisal, uh, that also I respectfully submit lacks any probative value whatsoever. Because what are they giving you? They give you a listing of properties that were sold, the square footage and what they sold for. I respectfully submit that square footage alone tells you nothing about the property. It doesn't tell you where they're situated, if they can see the tower, what the elevation is. or why did the home sell at that value? Was it a 100-year-old home that had never been updated? Did they have a new kitchen, a new bathroom? That lane appraisal shows you nothing, nothing. If you really want to get an appraisal, do what was done in Hickory, where they have another application pending. An appraiser went in and did two appraisals on the nearby homes. They did one appraisal to show what the homes are worth now, and a second appraisal showing you what the home would be worth if the tower went up. And not remarkably, every single home lost value collectively millions of dollars in value. So I respectfully submit their lane appraisal reports are also defective. And once again, to the extent that Mr. Grave saw fit to accept a contract to provide services and fail to disclose his conflict of interest to you, I respectfully submit that that speaks volumes as to his veracity, and I respectfully submit that this board should do precisely what other boards have done when I told them about this conflict, and that is they disregarded his report in its entirely. On top of that, there are less, alter less intrusive alternative locations. Of course, on the site, if you move it away, that'll help some. But as I mentioned before the, the planning board, there's a far, suitable, uh, a far superior suitable alternative um, off to the side of uh, McDonough Memorial Park, where it could be placed away from everybody's homes. Uh, the only reason Homeland wouldn't go for that application, it, unless the town doesn't want it there, um, is that it's more expensive because consistent, the only thing consistent about every application, they always go for the cheapest location. And if they want to put it, if they have a choice of putting it right next to people's homes on property that's already developed and out in the woods, they never go in the woods. And it's simple. If they go in the woods, they have to clear foliage, they have to put in a gravel access road, mm -hmm. they have to run utility poles and wires. They don't want to pay for that. The only thing they care about is, quite frankly, the least expensive location. 
and I respectfully submit if the board reviews the record, you'll find there are far less intrusive potential alternative sites. Any questions? Board members? No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. No questions, thank you. All right, sir. State your name and address for the record. And when you leave the podium, just fill your name out, please. Yeah, my name's already on the uh, sheet. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Just turn the mic up because it's being uh, recorded. Thank you. How's that? Good. Thank you. Robert Montanaro, 30 Brittany Lane. Uh, I'll speak for quite a few folks uh, that have been coming here on many evenings to planning and zoning board meetings, even though they've got to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and get to work. I have a lot of respect for those people. And I appreciate this board hearing us out as homeowners and taxpayers. The documentation that's been submitted by local realtors is not disputable. We've already documented 10 to 30 percent reduction in homes, which go in the dozens, which adds to millions of dollars. Again, quite a bit to justify any type of litigation we want to pursue. Those same homeowners pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes every year to this town. We also uh, look at the driveway situation. Uh, Dixon Road already has an issue in the spring, winter, and fall with runoff and freeze thaw. You widen this driveway, you'll have an even further issue. Last but not least, and very importantly, we've talked about the fact that there are alternate, less intrusive sites if, in fact, a tower is even needed, and they certainly have not proven that a tower is needed in this area. We started to take a look and say, well, were other sites even explored? I've heard their attorney uh, speak about the fact that they were turned down at other sites, but I'll give you a copy of a letter that we obtained from a gentleman by the name of Dave Fafaro. He signed it, and uh, the letter's dated September 18th. I'll give you folks plenty of copies, and uh, I'll read his letter, and then I'll make some comments on it. Dear board, I, Dave Fafaro, met with Klaus, and Klaus he refers to as Klaus Wimmer. That's the regional manager for Homeland. Met with Klaus from Homeland Towers on November 20th of 2018 at 10 a.m. at Jimmy McDonough Park in my official capacity at the time as the chairman of the Town of Carmel Recreation Advisory Committee. We discussed several locations at Jimmy McDonough Park for a potential cell tower. Klaus would not consider any of these remote sites because of cost. Klaus explained the money in the cell tower business was, quote, drying up, and at the time, Homeland Towers did not have the funds to make any improvements to facilitate a site off the road or parking area in the park. This included sites to the east of the park fields, which is a very large open area. If you know the area, I've actually took it upon myself to walk the area to take a look. I'll give you copies of the letter. I will confess that I originally thought that Homeland and their president, who sits in this room, was not concerned about money. They are concerned about money. They're just not concerned about our money. That's who I'm talking to. These folks in this room, these folks that are listening from home, it's their home equity that they sweat for, that you want to take 10 to 30% so that the P&L of Homeland looks a little fatter at the end of the year. That is outrageous to us, and we're not going to take it lying down, personally or not personally. I'll give you a copy of the letter. I thank this board for their time, and I implore you to knock this down and not approve it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> John, you mind putting them in the uh, thank you, Robert. folder? Uh, any more input from the public? Sir? Uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Larry Gray, 20 Brittany Lane. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Um, I just want to build a little bit on what's been talked about here in terms of property values and on a number of these meetings, the, the Lane appraisal and how it's being represented. And even when it was discussed earlier, there's been a lot of head nodding over here, and, and I think all of us are getting fed up with one side is always right and the residents are always wrong. 
Um, what I want to talk about the Lane appraisal, and, and for the record, I have a degree in mathematics. I've been in research and analytics for 30 years, so I know what I'm talking about when it comes to numbers and how to do an analysis. What I'm not saying is the Lane appraisal is inaccurate. What I'm telling you is it's being misrepresented. It does not address the impact. Impact means change before and after of property values. What the Lane appraisal does, and I went to the town, got a copy of it, and read it and dissected it over the weekend months ago. Basically, what it does, you heard a little bit before, they take and they looked at several properties in this area, and it's done by an accredited real estate appraiser, not questioning any of that. But what it does is it takes a look at properties within the view of a tower, takes the sell price divided by the square footage that we heard before, and then compares that to homes further away. And in each one of these cases, they'll say, well, this group is worth $3 more per square foot than this group. Big deal. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about what's my home value today worth and what's it going to be the day after the tower goes up. That's what I want to know. And that's not what the Lane appraisal does. Okay? It just, it, it, it's, it's funny math. It's just, this is what this is worth, that's what this is worth. Impact means change. It doesn't do a before and after. And that's very important because we keep talking about this, that our uh, property values go up. They don't go up. All the entire lane appraisal is done in the context of that one time frame. And that's very important to understand. So analytically, it's not uh, measuring the impact of these property values, and that's, and, and that's very important. So um, you know, I just want to make sure that that's on the record because we keep referring back to this lane appraisal as, well, they've submitted it, and it must be right, and our property values go up. It's not. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just yeah, sign it. Anybody else wish to be heard from the public? Well, come on up if you want to speak. State your name and address for the record. Linda Montanaro, 30 Brittany Lane. This is. It's basically by sending a shorter version of what I just said. Okay. John, do you mind putting that in? Or? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help I you God. I do. Thank you. Um, so they did a variety of balloon tests, some failed, some crane tests. Just want to show you what it actually looks like. Because I'm sure you don't have this picture. I'm sure they only show you the pictures that they want. I think we've seen this picture. That's right, from my driveway. Didn't you provide it to us the last time? I just want to make sure that you guys know that that's what it actually looks like when you're either driving Did by. Did you submit these pictures prior? Yeah. Those were looks familiar. submitted by my pictures, lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was a balloon test. That was the that's low right. balloon yeah. test because the second balloon test failed and they just didn't do another one. So that's what I'm going to see when I'm sitting on my back porch. Okay. So don't believe what you see. Visuals can be manipulated as well as statistics. Right. Name Hi. and address? My name is Renee Pereira, 42 Brittany Lane. I swear to tell the truth. I the do. whole truth, nothing about the truth, so I'll help you out. I do. Thank Just you. one question. So I see that it looks like they're proposing to chain, change the location. So does that mean they have to do another balloon test? That, that has never been asked, it's never been discussed, so I'm just curious, are they doing another balloon test? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I would think if it's in the same vicinity, footprint-wise, it wouldn't make much of a difference. So from one section of the property to another, they do not have to do another balloon test? It would be up to the planning board to decide if yeah. they want that balloon test. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, just do me a favor, sign your name and address on the sign-in sheet. Anybody else wish to be heard? All right, council, do you want to respond to anything? Oh, I do have one more question. What's the process of when do you tell us if it's approved or not approved? We're going to nobody knows. We're going to vote on this tonight or carry it over or whatever we haven't decided yet. So we vote. There were actually six balloon tests and a crane test. They were actually at 150 feet, so the comment that it was failed and it wasn't done again is not correct. We actually did six 
that were fully noticed plus the crane test so and they and they ma'am you got to address the board and that was documented in the Saratoga report it was documented to the planning board it's also in the copies of the materials you have uh, and it was done at 150 feet as opposed to the proposed 110 feet we also did additional visual renderings at the alternative location both from Brittany and from the park and those are in your application package as